next set of presentations will now focus on interventions to prevent suicide. For the first talk in this series, I am delighted to welcome our next presenter, Dr. Matthew Miller, who will be discussing firearm interventions. Uh, good morning, and um, thank you uh, so much uh, for the invitation to uh, to talk at the symposium about uh, the role of fire firearms uh, in U.S. suicide mortality. Most Americans um, feel that the that, that guns don't, in fact, have a causal role based on the surveys that we've done. One that just came out this past fall. Um, and I hope that um, by reviewing some of the studies uh, today, um, that uh, you will you will also see it a, a, as I do, which is that uh, that that is a a, a gravely mistaken uh, belief. Uh, in 2020, there were nearly 46,000 suicides. Um, more than half were firearm suicides. Uh, that more than half of all suicides and firearm suicides is something that goes back as far as uh, data have, have been recorded in the United States. Uh, the likelihood of death when you make an attempt with a gun is very high. Few people get second chances. The case fatality ratio is around 90%. Sort of by contrast, when you attempt with the most uh, commonly used methods, pills and cutting instruments, the likelihood of dying is less than 2%. Most of the firearms that are used in suicides come from the victim's home. Most of those guns have been there for a while. Few people buy guns with the uh, and then go on to kill themselves within the next couple of weeks. In a study by Kellerman, uh, it was uh, three percent of, of suicide uh, victims used a gun uh, that they had bought within the prior month. And most people who died by suicide died on their first attempt. This graph um, shows you how much suicide rates in the United States vary across the 50 states. It vary um, uh, almost fourfold uh, from states like Massachusetts at the lower end to states like uh, Montana, Alaska at the, at the high end. What doesn't vary across the 50 states are measures of serious psychological distress, major depressive disorder, doesn't really change very much from, in, 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 from, from, from state to state. If you look at states that have the lowest suicide rate and you compare them to the states that have the highest suicide rate, you're not gonna find higher rates of depression. You're not gonna find higher rates of suicidal ideation and you're not gonna find higher rates of suicide attempts. What you are gonna find in the states that have the highest suicide rates is more gun suicides. And what you're also gonna find is that more of the people in those states live in homes with guns. This is a, a paper um, that happily does have the citations, um, uh, a paper that I did with my colleague, Deb Israel, uh, a, a former statistician here, Richard White and Captain Barber, which just tried to make the, 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 the general point that that previous slide made, but, but give you a sense of the, the toll in lives. What we did is we took the states with the highest gun ownership, group them together so that the same population, the same population of that group, and the states with the lowest gun ownership. So these are person years, but they're about 31 million people in both of those two groups. Same number of people. Suicide attempt rates in each uh, of those groups were about the same. As you can see, if you look at the pink shade, it's my cursor work yet. Yeah. There were about the same number of non-firing suicides in the high gun states and the low gun states. What differentiated the two is that there are 7,300 firearm suicides in the high gun states and 1,700 in the low-gun states. What drove the overall suicide rate was obviously the, the firearm suicide rate, and that's highly correlated with the, the, the state-level uh, gun ownership rates. So what do we know from individual-level studies? Here is a meta-analysis by Engelmeyer of the case control studies uh, that have been done to date. And you'll notice that most of them were done in the late 80s and 90s and early aughts. Um, the uh, pooled Point estimate from these studies um, uh, has, has an odd ratio of 3.2. Um, the exposure in almost all of these, all but one, was the presence of the gun in the home determined on psych autopsy. 
spoke to a proxy of the decedent, is there a gun in your home? Not personal ownership, but is there a gun in your home? The outcome was a death, uh, a suicide death, but a, a member of the household. And when in a few studies that actually decomposed suicide into the methods that were used, fire and suicide, all other methods, it was the relationship between living in a home with a gun and dying by fire and suicide that drove the relationship between living in a home with a gun and overall suicide. Uh, and and the, the, the odds ratios, if, if you compare them among men, among women, among children, they're all in the three to five range. And many, many um, of these studies adjusted for the kind of uh, uh, risk factors that you would, so that you would hope candidate risk factors, mental illness, substance abuse, uh, uh, li living alone, things like that. But they didn't adjust for sort of all conceivable uh, predictors of suicide and critics of, uh, of, of these studies and of the guns playing a causal role in increasing suicide rates in the United States. The critics, uh, including critics that, that make these arguments in, in amici briefs to, to, uh, to the Supreme Court, argue that there is some unmeasured confounder that, is, uh, ex that explains away the associated in these, in these studies. And uh, when I was talking with uh, Sonia Swanson about this, uh, uh, we decided, thanks to sort of her insights, to, to try to conduct um, some bias analysis to address sort of that, that critique as best as we could with observational data. Um, and so that's what we did. Uh, before getting to those, I want to talk to you about a few surveys that I did before Sonia had that great idea. Uh, uh, that, um, but that are still sort of serviceable, and that that uh, that, that I did with my my good friend and long-standing colleague Deb Israel. Okay, so there are, there are a number of surveys, um, including the ones that we did, that asked um, whether people who lived in homes with guns differ from people who lived in homes without guns in terms of well-established psychiatric risk factors. And the answer to that is no, they don't. They don't have higher rates of mental illness. They don't have higher rates of substance abuse disorder. They don't have high rates of suicidal ideation or suicide attempts. There was one study in Seattle that found um, a recent study by Ali Rawani that found in a, in a state level BRF estimate, people who lived in homes with guns um, were about 20% more likely to binge drink. Aside from that, sort of all of the other established uh, 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 risk factors um, for suicide were, were, were similar. So what did, um, what, did, what, did, what did we do with Sonia's idea? Well, we did two types of bias analysis. The first, was um, asking, could you explain away sort of the, the, the causal uh, uh, connection? Could you explain away the, the, the causal uh, uh, association between living in a home with a gun in the case control studies and death by suicide? And the second um, asked uh, 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 a question that how could, we, could we adjust sort of the existing estimates based on external data? Um, so the first, the first analysis um, looked at um, home uh, at uh, an ex uh, looked at what potential binary confounder, how strong it would have to be to nullify the relationship in four studies that met our our selection criteria. The selection criteria really had to do with having living controls, and I'm, I've um, highlighted one of the four study in adolescence. What you can see P zero is the prevalence of a very strong risk factor, something that would increase the risk of suicide tenfold. That's what the R relative risk. A very strong risk factor. If, it, if there were such a risk factor and it were present in 5% of homes, people who, um, who, who, who did not have guns, how prevalent would it have to be in homes with guns? It would have to be prevalent, it have to be present in 60% of those homes. If this putative strong risk factor were present in 15% of homes with, um, with, 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 with uh, uh, without guns, it would have to be present in more than 100% of homes with guns. It's mathematically uh, in, impossible. Uh, and, um, and so it, it, in summary, with respect to the, this putative confounder, it would have to have an untenable combination of characteristics. It would have to be a risk factor as strong as sort of pretty much all well-established, the most strongest well-established risk factors for death by suicide. It would have to be more imbalanced by an order of magnitude right, than any of the uh, 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 suicide risk factors in all of the previous studies that we've looked at, those surveys I just told you about, in order of magnitude more balanced. And it would also have to be uncorrelated with all the things that the studies took into account in their analysis. So if no such confounder uh, has been found, named, or even suggested, 
The second um, uh, uh, bias analysis took the uh, David Brent study of adolescents, um, which had an adjusted odds ratio of 4.4, and asked, um, based on information in the National Comorbidity Study of Adolescents, looking at, at, at those risk factors that were imbalanced in homes with adolescents and guns, in homes without guns and adolescents, um, what, what, what would happen if we adjusted for those? And as with the adults, there were a few imbalances. The, the, most, the biggest ones have to do with substance abuse uh, disorders, for example, alcohol dependence. After um, accounting for that, factoring that into the, 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 the analyses, um, almost all of the point estimates remained above four. And even in this sort of hyper conservative uh, analysis in which we said all of the imbalances in the national comorbidity study that were not present in the original rent analysis. Um, that they, they were independent of one another and independent of everything measured in rent. Uh, then the point estimate would move, but it would only move to 3.1. And so um, again, uh, the, 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 the findings um, based on trying to find a, 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 an unmeasured confounder are pretty robust. The next set of um, slides have to do with a a cohort that uh, David Stutter um, um, has pulled together. This little picture at the bottom is a Herculean. You should still mind me to say that it took a, it was a Herculean effort to, to pull this together. Um, he had uh, wonderful help from uh, Yifan Zhang and um, a lot of intellectual input from Sonia Swanson um, as well. Um, what this cohort uh, uh, did is it took the dealer record of sale, which is a registry for firearms that exists in California, but doesn't exist in any other state. This study could only be done in California because we do not collect information about who has guns, how many guns they have in any other state in a way that allows this sort of research to be done. We took the dealer record of sales, linked them to the voter files, linked them to the mortality data, and created a cohort of registered voters um, in California um, at both personal, household gun, personal ownership level, and also through that at address linkage to household level gun ownership. So we knew if someone lived in a home with a gun and wasn't a gun owner, we knew, we knew if someone lived in a home with a gun and was a gun owner. And we could then sort of do the first sort of individual level studies, cohort studies, looking at how those exposures affect suicide risk. Um, 29 million people in this cohort followed up over 12 years, 1.2 million purchased guns over that period. 1.7 million died, almost 14,000 from gunshot wounds. And the information that we had, time varying information um, uh, on, 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 the, on, the, uh, on the factors that you see on the, on the screen based on the linked cohorts, uh, that, the, the linked uh, data sets that I mentioned previously. Okay. There are two studies about acquiring guns. Um, one, Remember, the case control studies were all household level exposure here. We are actually able to ask a question that faces people uh, that, and that we hope people are, sort of are asking themselves or should be asking themselves. One is how does, sort of, how does my risk change, my suicide risk change if I become a gunner, a handgun owner? So everyone in that study started out as a non handgun owner. Some people became handgun owners, others remained non-owners, and we could see what happened to the rate of suicide by method over time in those two um, exposure arms. And then the second study asked uh, about household level exposure. Uh, what does the effect of my becoming a handgun owner have with uh, on the suicide risk of a woman I'm living with who remains a non-owner? We started out in homes, not in a gun-free home. I became a handgun owner, lawful handgun owner. How does that affect, let's say, my, my wife's risk of dying by suicide? That's the question that, the, that this study attempted to answer. And the third study was about the death sentence. What happens to my suicide risk as a gun owner if I get rid of all my guns? I'm not going to say more about that last study other than it, it underscores the importance of negative controls. It's a complicated study, that, uh, uh, and I'm happy, but I'm happy to take questions about that during the uh, question and answer period. Okay, the first study uh, in that, uh, about personal gun ownership. How does my risk of suicide change if I become a handgun owner? The, the sort of the overall um, uh, hazards for the entire study period, my suicide risk increased uh, by 3.7, 3.7 times down at the bottom. 
driven entirely by firearm suicide risk that was nine times higher without any sort of difference in my, uh, I'm sorry, the, the rate of, of, uh, of non-firearm suicide in the compared to people who became handgunners to people who remain non-handgunners. So like in the case control studies, like in the ecologic data I showed you, what drives the overall suicide rates is the firearm suicide rate. There's, very, there's, there's almost no legal substitution to other methods in, 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 in this study either. The graphs show you um, a, a cumulative uh, a survival curve for firearm suicide. The first inset, oh yeah, there's my code. The first dense set shows you a steep decline over the first two weeks, and then a, a, a steep but not quite a steep decline thereafter, which persists for the rest of the study. What what it, the the first fifteen uh, days or so, um, the, about about fourteen percent of all firearm suicides occurred during that time. So there is a steep, a high, a high risk period right after um, some people buy guns. But remember in the Kellerman study that I mentioned, that in a, it was a prevalent study, only 3% of all firearm suicide deaths occur um, with someone buying a gun within the previous month. This is sort of like a new user type design, but 15% of people who become new gun owners and go on to die, 15% will die early on. So it is a high risk period, but don't lose sight of the fact that the, the risk persists at well over threefold for the rest of the for the rest of the study. Um, we had negative controls, overdose uh, uh, deaths, um, uh, alcohol, liver disease. They, they were not elevated among uh, the, the, the gun owners um, relative to the, to the, to the non-owners. Um, and, and you can think of these as likely lower bounds, I do at least, um, in, in as much as uh, people we classified as unexposed because they did not have a record of a lawful handgun purchase may well have um, had owned handguns before the registry started, 85, or may have acquired guns unlawfully. Um, and so that, that we may have mischaracterized some unexposed as, uh, some truly exposed as unexposed. Okay, here's this study. What, what effect does my getting a gun have on my, 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 my wife's risk of dying by suicide? Here we have a cumulative incidence uh, uh, curve, but uh, I'll summarize the, as I did previously. So the overall, uh, uh, rate of suicide among women who started to, who, who's, who's cohabitant, uh, started, uh, became a lawful handgun owner, was 40% higher than women who continued to live in homes with uh, 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 non-gun non, non, non owners. These are non-gun owning women. Her risk is increased 40% uh, uh, when, when her partner becomes a lawful handgun owner. That's, again, all, all driven entirely by a fourfold increased risk in firearm suicide, as you can see at the bottom of the page. And the non-firearm suicide rate really was no higher, uh, no lower uh, among women whose uh, cohabitants became lawful handgun owners. Over a 10-year period, you can see the cumulative incidence um, curves that separate early. And by 10 years, um, effectively, what you have is for every 100,000 women, whose cohabitant became a lawful handgun owner, you have an, uh, an additional 22 suicides compared to the, the women who um, continue to live uh, in handgun-free homes with someone else. And, and here too, the negative controls are no more common among owners. So um, I mentioned at the, at the beginning of the talk that most Americans do not think that guns play calls a role in, um, in, in, in US mortality. Um, I hope that uh, the data that I've shared with you today um, it is, is somewhat convincing. Uh, it, it, it's convincing to me that, that not only do guns play a causal role, but in trying to estimate how much it increases the risk of suicide for someone who becomes a donor or how much it imposes a risk on someone with whom they're living, that it's substantial. Um, there are lots of questions about effect sizes. Uh, that we don't know lots of questions um, yet to be answered, and maybe some people in the audience uh, would be interested in in, uh, in trying to answer those questions. Obviously, we're not going to do randomized trials um, uh, to answer some of these fundamental, all these fundamental questions. Um, but, uh, but but I think we have an obligation to act on what we already know from these and other studies, and um, and that that means uh, trying to trying to trying to. Trying to reduce access to guns for people who are at risk 
you so much, Dr. Miller. Uh, as you mentioned at the end, I think this is a great example of a question for which a randomized trial is not practical, and therefore we have to rely on observational data to provide any evidence for this question, thinking carefully about confounding bias and other biases. And I also liked how you mentioned negative outcome controls as a useful way to probe potential unmeasured confounding. And so I was wondering, in the analyses of divestment, mm -hmm. whether any negative outcome controls may have been incorporated there. And also more generally, if there's any challenges to studying divestment as an intervention using observational data. Well, yeah, those are great questions. Um, uh, thank you for them. The, so the, the reason, the reason to, to try to do a divestment study right, is because it sort of mirrors in what we're hoping to do by counseling people to get rid of their guns when they're right at their high risk side. And, and as you saw with that very steep initial period um, in the uh, in, 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 in the New England Journal paper, there there, there is some reverse going causation going on, you know, in, in initially. Although that's not going to explain why non gun owners have higher rates of suicide or or children for that matter. So we were motivated to do that, and and um, we were motivated because almost nothing was known about investment, and yet it sort of mirrors sort of a lot of the interventions. We um, we had uh, uh, negative controls, um, and all of those were sort of wildly elevated, which makes interpreting sort of the it was clear that the the the, um, the the point estimates for overall suicide sort of were wildly confounded, but because of that, and also because the non farm suicide rate was actually seven times higher in the people who divested. Like, there's no reason that my getting rid of a gun should increase my non farm suicide rate sevenfold. It also increased the rate of, of overdose death more than three and a half fold. And so, what we did, you know, as tempting as it may have been to say, oh, that just doesn't look good, let's put it in the drawer. Because these other studies are really clean and, and we, can, we, we think that, that they're not, but they're not uh, uh, confounded. Uh, uh, but to, you know, to Sonia's great credit, um, we thought about how we could do bias adjusted analysis. Like one simple uh, attempt at that is, well, if the non-farm suicide rate is seven times higher, and divestment shouldn't affect the non-farm suicide rate, let's just discount by sevenfold the suicide, uh, the, 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 the overall suicide rate and the farm suicide rate. And if you do that, what's interesting is that it produces the, basically the mirror image of protective effects that you got from the uh, New England Journal study for harmful effects of becoming an owner. If you then use a device adjusted analyses um, based on sort of other known shared risk factors for both opioid overdose, for example, and for um, suicide, across you know, any plausible range of those confounders, you also get sort of an adjusted, a bias adjusted estimate of um, something that is sort of the mirror image of the, of the, of the New England Journal study. Um, you know, we, we sort of think that those data, you know, certainly point towards there being a protective effect of investment. That's what our guess would have been sort of based on everything that preceded it. Uh, but um, now you can see why I didn't want to take up my entire talk uh, by, by talking about that. That's great, thank you so much. Any questions, comments from the audience? In fact, please. Testing, testing, okay. <laughs> uh, great talk, thank you, Dr. Miller. I wanted to check on the belief that RCTs are not feasible, because <laughs> it seems to me somewhat straightforward that if you look at divestment as a treatment or intervention, that's important for our community to develop strong capacity to influence that you, if you already have, especially a California cohort, you know, if you can do, and you have limited resources, you can't treat all of California or all gun owners in California. It seems like an ideal place to do an RCT, which could start with a low cost intervention, such as mail or phone calls, looking at you know, voter turnout literature. And then if you can do an even stronger intervention through in-person communication or counseling, that you could really start to develop alternative interventions and influence suicide in a strong way. Thank you for the for that comment and um, and uh, uh, disguised as a question, but it's a it's it's a worthwhile it's a really important comment to make. Um, the the unfortunately, like we don't have great 
actual, not hypothetical, but actual interventions that, that really make it, that, 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 that were, were, have a big effect on people getting rid of their guns, not that we've developed yet. Plus, the su if you're going to study suicide, right, death by suicide as an outcome. The RC, you need enormous RCTs. There are also um, the problems using the California data, linking them to other data sets. There's now a suit uh, 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 by pro-gun pro -gun group to keep the state of California from sharing, the, uh, from sharing those data. It's just a judge who came out with a, a stay on, on using the, the, these data. Uh, but you're, I think you're right. I, I don't want to throw away the possibility of doing randomized trials, but the outcomes that we have to look at would have to be outcomes that uh, we think are good proxies of, uh, of, inter of, of interventions that actually result in uh, a saving of lives. So if you could do something right, with store changes in storage practices among youth, maybe, although uh, better what you were suggesting, get, see if you could get rid of, get, get, get people to invest in their guns and what the effect on, on suicide rates would be. But actually, Figure out how to do that um, is uh, it is really challenging. But you're right. With divestment, you're you know certainly ethical, right? To, to try to get people to divest. The randomized trial that, that I had in mind is sort of that this would be impossible to do is to randomize people to to, have, to, to, to live in homes with guns and and not. Thank you so much. I have one more question on the right here. Oh, hi. Is it possible that um, people who own guns tend to have um, a stronger, like, underlying, like, higher risk and like, riskier behavior in general um, because of kind of the environments they grew up in, whether it's in their communities or in their families, and they're compared to people who don't own, own guns, and therefore, does that change anything about whether gun ownership is maybe just a proxy for? underlying riskier behavior for suicide? So that, that's a good question. The, the empirical data that, that try to respond to that are, are the ones that I've shown. When you look at, uh, so clearly gun owners are different from non-gun owners. They, they want guns. The question is, are they different in ways that put them at, at much higher risk of suicide? And when, when you look at, at, at the characteristics that we know predict suicide, and you ask, are they different among people who own guns and people who don't own guns? What you find is, no, they're not. So. Um, and from the bias analyses, they have to be like really strong predictors that somehow we haven't identified previously in all of the sort of psychiatric and even epidemiological literature. And they have to be sort of orthogonal to the kind of things that are already adjusted for in analyses. So it, it, to me, um, the, the, the likelihood that confounding is distorting the estimates greatly. Is, uh, is, is I think something we've dealt with really well. What we haven't dealt with as well are the other potential biases um, that could affect the point estimates. Thank you so much.